Well, today finds me on a midsummer adventure on the East Fork of the White River here in uh, South Central Indiana in Jackson County, just outside of Brownstown. We got about a nine or 10 mile float down to what's called the Medora Covered Bridge with public access here on Route 50. You can hear the trucks coming over. We got public access here for easy boat launching and public launch at the covered bridge as well. So this is a major river through south central Indiana. The East Fork of the White River starts east of Indianapolis, flows east of Indianapolis along I-65 and eventually cuts west all the way over to the main fork of the White River, which actually originates in Indianapolis area. So a real peaceful, slow moving river here. Not much gradient here, a couple feet per mile. Lots of lazy bends and some bayous where the river has cut itself off and made some temporary lakes. And hopefully lots of wildlife to look at along the way too. So we'll be on the river here for three or four hours. We'll stop and see what's along the way. We've got fair weather, lower humidity, not much chance of thunderstorms today. Temperatures in the 80s, good, good, good weather for being on the water. I'll do a quick outline of where this trip is today. We've got the uh, trip marked in green here, and it's between 9 and 10 miles, depending on how the river has straightened itself out over the years. These meanders sometimes get cut off and makes for less paddling. So some heavier rain early this week brought this river up a couple feet. It's on its way back down. The gauge upstream from here in Seymour, about 10 miles east of here, is at 4.47 feet and dropping. So it's not real high today, but enough that the paddling would be easy. And that is also converts to uh, 1,660 cubic feet per second. So this is actually just west of Brownstown. You'll see the L there on US 50 and down by the Medora Covered Bridge is another launch. I've got a blown up map here that shows this in more detail and we'll plot our course as we go. We've got several oxbow lakes that have formed from meanders that have been cut off by the river. And we might even have time to go back and paddle around those. I've been told by the other guys here today that there's some bald eagles in this area. So it could be for some interesting wildlife viewing. Boy, it didn't take long to start seeing wildlife on this trip. I'm just barely around the first bend. I've already seen a, a, a mature bald eagle with the white head. And we got a little less elusive species of bird here. They don't like me talking, but here they go, the Canadian geese. And those are uh, pretty common, almost a nuisance in a lot of places. They're just real pretty. All kinds of bends in this river with gravel bars, which makes for interesting habitat for all kinds of plants and animals here. And big water, this is runnable all year round when it's not frozen or flooded. So... A lot of the feeder streams in this area have some interesting rock formations and um, even some uh, old mills along the way, but water levels in July are up and down quick and um, you got to be able to catch them exactly when they're right. So um, this was the better option for today. Let's keep on paddling. The nice thing about the second half of summer as the daylight is a little softer, it makes for great photography with these browns and blues and greens. It's mid-morning here, but the sun is not overbearing. It makes for interesting shadows, some great contrast. And the old canoe there, that's 32-year-old boat that's hanging in there. Got a lot of algae growing on it from sitting behind the garage too long, but it's a great boat for portaging. It's a light boat made out of fiberglass. That's what I use on a lot of these trips. I'm exploring one of the sandbars here on the east fork of the uh, White River. And I'm doing a channel on tree identification called Barking Up the Right Tree, B-A-R-K-I-N apostrophe, Up the Right Tree. And I'm going to be shooting some videos here of these willows. We've got two species of willow here. The one I can get to easiest is the sandbar willow, which stabilizes these, uh, these sandbars, keeps them from eroding away too quickly. A river like this that's slow moving often meanders and changes courses, especially during high water events. So this helps stabilize these banks and keeps it from eroding away too quickly. These sandbar willows don't get that tall. They're more of a shrub. 
And behind it in the background are some tree willows, which are the black willow. And they can get full height if they get enough sun. So I'll be doing some segments on that on the other channel here, but just a just a little look at this habitat here. This is the uh, inside of an oxbow bend, and this is where the sediment accumulates during high water periods. And then the bend goes the other way, and it's cutting away at this cornfield in the background. And I've got some hibiscus in my sights here along the east fork of the White River here in Jackson County, Indiana, and I've seen several patches of it growing along here. I'm beginning to believe it could be native. Um, I'll have to admit my knowledge of all the plants, shrubs, trees, and flowers is not as deep as a professional botanist, so I'm not sure if there is a native hibiscus in this area or not. I'm going to have to look that up. We can tack that on to the end of the, this segment um, when I finish the trip. Boy, but it's so beautiful. It's got about a four inch wide flower with that maroon color on the inside. I mentioned on my spring wildflower trips that maroon color often uh, gives off the scent of carrion to attract carrion flies. I don't know if that's the case or not with this one. I'm not going to find out. Um, it's a beautiful flower and is a common garden plant, the Rose of Sharon. I'm not sure if this is the same variety or not. The fact that it's growing in these clumps here makes me wonder whether it's native or not there are houses within a mile of here and if it easily um, escapes from gardens then that could be the case so we'll have to look that up and take do, do some more information on that in a few minutes here but you know we get a second wildflower season in july and august and september for the plants that are in full sun and those that are in deep shade do their flowering in March, April, and early May. And we've made our way about two-thirds of the way down this stretch of river on the east fork of the White River in Jackson County, Indiana. And found a little eddy here underneath the sycamore tree to get a little shade, eat some lunch. And our next point of interest that I know of is the Medora Cover Bridge. This is where we actually disembark from the river and uh, stow the canoe in the woods while I ride my bicycle back to the uh, truck to make the shuttle. So sometimes you forget how long it takes to do a shuttle when you're doing a canoe trip, but you need to allow time for it. I'm going to try to get off the river before 3 p.m. to allow a couple hours for the shuttle. And uh, you know, folks, this is not a wilderness area. <laughs> But I've, this is a 10 mile stretch of river. There's a few summer homes, not even homes, more just uh, cottages up on stilts along this stretch of river. And the rest of it is woodland and maybe a peak at farmland once in a while. But all kinds of habitat here for all kinds of animals. I've seen several types of turtles. I've seen wood ducks. I've seen two different bald eagles several miles apart, unless it was the same one. But I've seen them twice if it was. And, um,. All kinds of plants along here and uh, just some just a great place to get away from noise and and the sight and sounds of um, humanity I mean this is very peaceful even though we're not far from any particular town this is a very rural area most of Indiana when you get out of the cities is very very rural and uh, it doesn't take long to get away from from what looks like civilization so uh, rec definitely recommend this trip and I'm gonna do a foot footage of that covered bridge in a few minutes here and continue on well I've mentioned um, on this trip that the river meanders a lot and makes these big sweeping curves because this is a relatively broad valley with lots of room to wiggle and wander and many rivers that are in similar situations do so including the lower Mississippi River from the junction of the Ohio down it's a huge river with huge meanders and they're moving all the time, always creating new habitat for plants to uh, come in and take over these sandbars here. And what I'm looking at here is the high water channel that used to be an old meander, but the river has found a shortcut through this neck of land. And probably the only navigational challenge I'm going to have today is some of these tree stumps. Because this is basically cut through a neck of land that used to be forested and all these trees have not been dislodged yet. So what I'm looking at here, folks, we're getting real near the end of this trip here. We are near the L 
for the launch or the takeout point at Medora Bridge. And I have done a little looking around on the satellite view, and it looks like this meander was a cutoff meander. I put a dotted line there above the L where the meander was cut off according to the satellite view. But if you look to the west or to the left of that L, there is a meander still in place on the map. And that's the old channel, and part of it has water in it still. So I may actually paddle back upstream and explore up there and see if we can find anything before I finish this trip. But these meandering streams often do cut off the meanders. They become what's called an oxbow lake and can create some interesting habitat for uh, pond fishing, basically. And eventually those will silt in and just become um, wooded. So... Um, Meandering streams are real common in some parts of the country, and in some parts of Indiana, the meanders have actually cut down into the limestone and created some um, some er real interesting rock formations just east of here on the Muscatatuck River and Sand Creek. Both have what's called entrenched meanders, which created some interesting um, places to go canoeing and hiking, and I might be looking at those in the future. Water was a little low this week to think about doing those. But meandering streams can make for some interesting places. And here's a real good example of a cut-off meander here on the white east branch of the east fork of the White River. And after coming through the cut-off part of the meander, I've gone back up the Oxbow Lake formed by the cut-off meander. And there is no current back here. This is pretty much a pond at this water level. At higher river levels, there would probably be some current coming around the uh, old oxbow. But right now, all the water is going through the cutoff part. And without having any current, it makes it a little easier to study some of these plants um, along the way. And I saw what I thought was a hibiscus earlier, and I just took the time to take some photos of it and look it up real quick. And sure enough, it is a hibiscus. It's called the halberd-leaved hibiscus or rose mallow is a common name, so it's H-A-L-B-E-R-D, leaved hibiscus. And it is common to the central United States in, slow, along, in wetlands and along slow-moving waterways. And I spent a lot of my time in the Appalachian Mountains, in the Appalachian foothills and New England, in parts of Ohio where the streams move along pretty quickly and they just don't provide this habitat. So this is a new one to me, even though I've spent many years canoeing. This just is um, a different type of habitat for me to explore in the canoe. And here's some of it in flower right here. These flowers last one day, but it does bloom all summer long is what I just read. So it looks like there's plenty more to come um, as the weeks go on here. But this oxbow here has created an opportunity for me to really study things up close without being swept downstream or having to fight the current. So um, these meandering streams in the mid and lower Ohio Valley provide some habitats for plants I'm just not used to finding and that's why I've made a lot of stops along here. And yeah we don't have a lot of whitewater adventure here but you know what sometimes the wildlife more than makes up for it. And several bald eagles, herons everywhere, ducks everywhere, and turtles everywhere, and too many to count. So right around the next bend is the takeout point with the Medora Covered Bridge, and let's continue on there. And as we finish the last uh, half mile this trip, the uh, Medora Covered Bridge comes into sight. Off in the distance there, this is just past where that um, Oxbow Lake is. And we're back in the current here, so the river's pushing us along. And this is one of the largest existing covered bridges in the country, is what I read about. I think there's a sign up here we can read to get even more information on it. But um, this is uh, certainly worth seeing, and there's um, a safe place to disembark the river here. So that's where we'll be going next. And we'll take a good look at the inside of this bridge in just a moment. Well, after approaching the Medora Covered Bridge, I got off the water and made my shuttle back and got back the canoe back on the truck and got everything back in one place. And that's part of the trip. That takes usually another hour, hour and a half at least. I got a little more time to look over this bridge. This is a huge covered bridge. It's one of the longest in existence. We've got these bent wooden trusses that support this bridge. There's two central supports in the river made out of cut stone. 
and three of these long wooden arches that support the bridge, providing some tensile strength from which these triangular members can be um, run off of. So there's your strength right there in that bow arch, and there's three of them. And each one of these bows ends on one of those stone uh, supports, the hand cut stone, looks like a quarried stone in the uh, center of the river. So let's take a look out here. We got some real pretty countryside around here at the end of this bridge. It's gonna come into view in just a second here. And continuing on, here we come out into some beautiful agricultural land here. And if you look in the background here, this will come in in just a minute here, we get the lighting a little more even. We've got some hills off in the distance that's, that's called Starve Hollow and Jackson, Washington State Forest. And there's a lot of hiking trails and wooded hillsides in that area way off in the distance. And to my west is the Hoosier National Forest and a lot of state forests around Brown County, Indiana, just to our northwest here. So this is an outdoor lover's paradise in this part of Indiana. I'm just going to review what I did on this trip. Here's the gauge reading that I got this morning, and that provided easy float. There was no real places to, that you would bottom out. There was a lot of logs in the river that could be avoided, but you do have to look out for them. And the only place there was any challenge was this cut-off meander right at the very end where the river has cut off this meander on that blue dotted line is the cutoff. There was a lot of trees that hadn't quite been um, removed as the river has cut through there. There's still some logs in the river that could be avoided, but it did require fairly precise boat handling. And that oxbow lake in the back of there could be reached from the downside of this. And I've got a clip on that. So the shuttle route back I did is in yellow. It's mostly on county roads to avoid traffic. I did it on a bicycle. It took about an hour. Um, most of those roads are very quiet. Route 50 itself has traffic, but it does have a shoulder as well, so it is feasible to ride it on a bicycle. And these other roads through Medora were fairly quiet as well. So that's what I've got here today at the East Fork of the White River in south central Indiana, and a great place just to spend a peaceful day and a great place to look for wildlife.